I'd like to introduce Cindy Ash, who is here with us this morning as our guest uh, pastor. And she is a recent graduate from the Dubuque Theological Seminary and the contemporary worship leader at the First Presbyterian Church in Decatur. <laughs> we are your people, O oh God, the sheep of your pasture, the flock that you have gathered. Lead us beside still waters. Teach us the way of righteousness and feed us at your table through Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. Amen. Amen. please stand and join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He knows us and we belong to him. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He speaks and we listen for his voice. And now we will sing, To God Be the Glory, hymn number 72, verses 1 and 3.
If we are honest with ourselves, our hearts condemn us. But God, who knows everything, is greater than our hearts. And God's deep desire for us is mercy, love, and peace. Therefore, let us confess our sin. Lord, have mercy on us. We talk about love, but our actions betray us. We talk about love, but we neglect the poor. We talk about love, but we fail to love one another. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us and abide in us by the power of your spirit so that our lives may show our love for Jesus Christ in whose body we live and in whose name we pray. Amen. We seek God's grace with boldness because we trust in Jesus Christ, the one who loves us and laid down his life for us. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God. So the little girl next to me when I sat down, she said, where's our pastor? And I said, well, that's me, but just for today. So 
Michael will be back next week. That's the good news, huh? So I'm so glad you guys are here this morning. There's lots of you. Do you know that? That's awesome. I'm glad to see you. My name's Cindy. I'm just going to visit today, okay? And then Michael will be back next week. So I got a question for you guys. You have to help me. Does anybody know what it means to share? Does anybody know what that means? Can you tell me what it means to share? You give somebody else your toys. That's right. What do you think? You can give away some of your clothes that don't fit you. That's right. What else do we share besides toys and clothes? Anything else? I think, did you have an idea? Does anybody share their room? Anybody? Yeah, you do? Who do you share your room with? Your brother. And is he little, littler than you or bigger than you? Littler. So you first had to start sharing your room. Hold on, babe. It was different. Was it tough? Yeah? But now, if you didn't have to share a room, wouldn't you be kind of lonely? Yeah, so it got easier the more you shared. That's right. Good job. So, you know, God tells us it's really important to share and to share with our neighbors. That means the people next to us, right? You know why? Because God was really good at sharing, really good at it. He shared his son with us. He shared Jesus with us. So I'm so happy that you guys are good at sharing. I want you to remember that, okay? When you see somebody around you that needs something and you have it and you can share, that's a good thing. Okay? Should we pray together? Okay. Dear God, help us to share when it's easy and when it's tough. Amen. Well, thank you so much, guys. You guys have fun. Our epistle reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. I invite you to listen to God's word. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and we love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in them, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Won't you pray with me? Dear God, we know your Holy Spirit is here with us. We ask that that Spirit open our eyes so that we may see, open our ears so that we may hear, and open our hearts so that we may be transformed, little by little, to be more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there are passages of scripture that are convicting, and 1 John 3, 16 through 24 is one of them. For as much as we try to find an alternate meaning to the text, one cannot be found. It's pretty straightforward. You know, the meaning is clear, it seems. How can we claim to abide in God's love, yet refuse to help our neighbors in need? Furthermore, John tells us that words, well, they're not enough. We are called to live out Christ's love in our actions. Pastor Ronald Cole Turner writes the following in his sermon on this text. For Christians, self-sacrifice should be ordinary, not extraordinary. 
We ought to lay down our lives, John writes, not, in, in, not intending to give a grand challenge for heroic Christians, but an everyday commandment for ordinary Christians. The Christian life is a laid down life for others, a life built on self-sacrifice. Maybe your gut response to this text is similar to mine, which is simply an overwhelmingly ugh. And that's big capital letters with a lot of exclamation marks, ugh. Because all around, I see my neighbors in need. It seems like even when I try to avoid it, I cannot escape it. It's everywhere I go. When I listen to the radio, it's there. When I pick up a newspaper or magazine, there it is. When I walk or drive almost anywhere, it will walk or drive right next to me. When I pick up my two and a half year old son from daycare that made his presence known this morning, I see it. And I know I'm not the only one. Surely you see it too. It simply is. My neighbors, your neighbors, our neighbors, they're in need. That is an inescapable, re inescapable reality. After all, one half of the people in this world live on less than $2 a day. The gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider. In a country once known for its generosity, 2.7% of Americans give away 10% of their income, while 86.2% give away less than 2%. The UN Refugee Agency reported on World Refugee Day last year that the number of refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people worldwide has for the first time since World War II exceeded 50 million people. That is 50 million people without a home wandering. Our prisons are busting at the seams, earning us the global nickname of incarceration nation. And so again, I say, ugh. Several weeks ago, I packed up my SUV with a week's worth of luggage my three children, ages 20, 14, and two, and we began the long journey south to Key West. Yes, we drove 24 long hours. This was a much needed vacation. It was my first one uh, in years. I've been in seminary for the past four years and I've used all my vacation to do that. I had planned the trip for months. I rented a condominium in the heart of city on Duval Street, if anyone's familiar with Key West. Everything was within walking distance. Great restaurants, beaches, shopping. There was a private pool for the condominium residents and we had our own hot tub. This was the ideal vacation, right? Tropical paradise. Well, it took me less than a matter of hours to notice that this tropical paradise wasn't so for everyone. Some images of the homeless wandering the streets of Key West struck me and I would like to share them with you. There was an elderly white man with shoulder length curly salt and pepper hair that was heavily weighed down with grease. His clothes were worn and ragged and inappropriately heavy for the hot days. He pushed a grocery cart with what appeared to be all his life's possessions. And I watched him dart as quickly as he was able, was able with a persistent limp to garbage cans as the contents of the last meal from vacationers like me were discarded. My tossed leftovers quickly became his next meal. There was a middle-aged black gentleman who appeared to try his very best not to appear as what he was. His clothes were clean, his hair was recently cut, he was recently shaven, but yet there he sat on the steps leading out of our condominium complex, past the locked door that I exited every morning. I tried to meet his gaze, but he appeared to look past me and I noticed after several encounters that his eyes were obstructed with cataracts. Sometimes he would remove his shoes on those steps, black worn dress shoes, totally inappropriate for a man walking the streets. He tried to maintain his composure, but I noticed the painful agony as he pulled those shoes from his feet. As much as I tried to pursue my attempt at physical and mental relaxation, I could not because no matter where I went, there they were with me. The reality of our neighbor's needs is inescapable. It's all around us. And yet I failed to act. I did nothing. 
and I hear the convicting words from 1 John, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to act? Clearly my heart condemned me. And I wonder, has your heart ever condemned you? Why do we, and I'm assuming that you act as I do, sit on our comfortable couches in our perfectly controlled temperature environments with full stomachs, safe from harm, and we quickly turn the channel when we're presented with images of children starving to death or animals who have been the victims of abuse and neglect? Why do we attempt to shield ourselves from suffering? Is it because we don't want to act? That is, if we don't know, if we don't see it, that we can continue to live in our fantasy lands, that everything and everyone is okay? Or do we turn the channel or walk past the homeless person on the street because we don't know what to do? We're simply overwhelmed. Or perhaps we feel like we've already done our part. Do you say to yourself something, something similar to what I say to myself? I try to remind God of all that I've already done. Or maybe we don't act out of fear. Are we afraid we won't have enough for ourselves? Enough time, enough money? Or is it our fear about how that person in need will respond? We can find so many reasons not to act, and yet none of them can serve as an excuse. Because scripture is clear. If we see a neighbor in need, and we have the resources to help, we are called to act. While the reasons for our inaction can't be our excuses, they are nonetheless important to understand. For me, my lack of response is often due to my feelings of being overwhelmed. What I realized through the process of writing the sermon is that my feelings of being overwhelmed often prevent me from fully serving those I've already committed to. You see, while I was obsessing over the homeless in the streets of Key West, I was in large part ignoring my family. When I allow the commercials of starving children to play over and over in my mind, I, I can't rest. Without some mental and physical rest, I can't fully serve those in need around me, and I'm sure you feel the same. This loop of never being enough, it's never enough, is a dangerous, self-destructive wheel that I'm confident God did not call us to. So what do we do? How do we live the lives of self-sacrifice that we were called to live without getting burnt out, without losing the joy that should come with following Christ? Because in reality, we cannot meet our neighbor's every need. We simply cannot. But we can meet many of their needs. For example, back to Key West, I could have brought a warm meal to my neighbor in Key West digging through the trash for his, for his next meal. I could have walked with the man to a local shoe store to buy him shoes that fit appropriately. And I wonder if some steps would be helpful to guide us in the future. The first step to meeting our neighbor's need is seeing the needs, right? Refusing to turn our eyes or our backs from the realities all around us. We are called both where we are, but also where we don't want to go. It's amazing when we get involved in our communities, the needs that exist. Our neighbors are hungry. Our neighbors are victims of domestic violence. Our neighbors' children are abused. Our neighbors are homeless. The second step after assessing your neighbor's need is assessing what are your talents? What are you good at? I mean, what do you like to do? What is it that makes you mad? I've often found that the social injustices that make us the angriest are where we're called to serve. And the third step is action. I like to call this leaning in. Maybe you love to read. Can you volunteer one day a week for an hour reading to children at risk who are lagging behind on their reading skills? Do you enjoy visiting with others? Can you spend a couple hours visiting with local nursing home residents? And in addition to deliberately scheduled service, I encourage you to pay attention to the needs all around you every day, like opening the door for someone whose hands are full, stopping to give direction to the person who's clearly lost, paying the difference at the grocery store when the person in front of you can't. These seemingly little things 
they make a huge difference. And here I put in capital letters, warning. And the warning here is don't overthink this stuff. I know people who literally have spent years in, in action trying to assess how it is they're being called to meet their, our neighbor's needs. Acting is a process of self-discovery, discovering what it is that you possess that allows you to best serve your neighbor's needs. As you engage in this process, remember it will cost you something. Discipleship is costly. But also remember the other piece, right? 1 John 3, 16, 24, in its entirety, that Christ laid down his life for us in both our action and our inaction. When we meet our neighbor's needs, we do it in response to God's grace. It's not an attempt to earn it. We cannot earn what has freely been given to each and every one of us. First John tells us that we are children from the truth, and that will reassure our hearts whenever our hearts condemn us. We are, after all, an Easter people. So while this passage is convicting, it is convicting in love, not in self-destructive guilt. After all, Christ was convicted of loving each of us, and it is that love that we are called to give to our neighbors through our actions. I invite you to live this radical love out loud, and let it begin now. And all the people said together, amen. The next part of our worship service is um, titled in your bulletin, The Congregation in Prayer. And I thought it would be appropriate today um, for us to call out the needs of our neighbors. You don't have to call them out by name, um, but the, this is a participatory prayer. So um, I encourage you to, to say out loud what our neighbors' needs are, and we'll pray for those together. So I'll start us in prayer, and then I'll, I'll open it up. Okay? Let us pray together. Good and gracious God, we're thankful to be here together to worship you with our neighbors. We're thankful for your generosity that you taught us how to share, God, and that you shared your son Jesus Christ with us. God, we recognize in your word that you call us, too, to share with our neighbors where there is need and where we have resources, God. Hear us as we say out loud our neighbors and their needs. God, you know our neighbor's needs. Help us to see them. Empower us to meet them. Let your spirit live through us and our generosity to one another. And we pray together the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I invite you to take a deep breath in as we prepare to leave this place, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and take it out into this world. In the name of the Good Shepherd, love one another. May the goodness and mercy of God follow you all the days of your life and at your life's end. May you dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all the people said together, Alleluia. Amen. Amen.